I'm originally from Iowa. I grew up in Charles City and went to Iowa State University for two years and majored in journalism. I transferred to the University of Wisconsin at Madison where I completed my journalism degree back in 1979, a long time ago. Uh, many years later, I, after, after working in journalism for a number of years, decided to return to graduate school. Uh, and in the mid-1990s, I returned to the University of Maryland at College Park where I earned the MA in History and also an MLS in Library Science. It was during that time in the early 1990s as I was working on that project that I became acquainted with Grant Price at Wartburg College. I had a very strong interest in broadcast history at that point, not only the, the uh, preservation of, of, of uh, storage media that, that are used in, in the broadcasting industry, but also the, the preservation of documents of um, broadcast stations. In the early 1990s, the archives, if you want to call it that, consisted of a collection of artifacts that he stored in his office. And it very quickly grew as materials were acquired over, uh, over a period of time. The first real project of the archives of Iowa Broadcasting was an oral history project that Grant Price undertook beginning in 1993 or 1994. The oral history project really became the, the core or the nucleus of what eventually became the archives of Iowa Broadcasting. We have a running joke in our profession, and if you're an archivist, you'll understand it. And, and even if you're not, you might understand it. When we, as archivists, pull material together, we arrange and describe them in the way that librarians do with books. But if you're working alone in a shop, if you are working independently without much help from outside, you tend to be named a lone arranger. That means you're pretty much working as, a, as an independent agent. And Grant Price, for a number of years, was a lone arranger. He was, I think, very much uh, of the opinion that this was uh, a significant endeavor, but at least initially there wasn't quite the, uh, uh, the, the support or the recognition that he needed in order for this to, take, uh, to, to gain traction. But that changed quickly. Uh, like many initiatives, at first probably it started rather quietly and he may have felt uh, alone at times in his efforts, but uh, I think within a few years, a few short years, he very, uh, very, uh, very quickly began to acquire the support and recognition that the, the project certainly deserved. The physical facility is excellent. There is a climate control vault, which is really uh, uh, an outstanding facility for the storage of sensitive media, such as film, uh, videotape from a certain era material that requires special storing uh, environments. And the facility at Vogel Library is really uh, an ideal site for that. It's a little hard to put an exact date on when the archive started, but by the time Vogel Library was rededicated in 1999, the archives was very well established as a repository, uh, which today has over 14,000 audiovisual items, uh, over 600 linear feet of documentary records, uh, publications, books, uh, original uh, uh, papers, organizational records. It's a very broad as well as rather deep collection of material that I don't think you're really going to be able to find any place else, certainly not within Iowa, and it's quite unusual among uh, state repositories around the country. There are perhaps two dozen media formats. I don't have an exact count, but the holdings in the archives are a reflection of a more than 60-year broadcast history of the state of Iowa. You look through the aisles of the broadcasting archives and you'll see any of a range of magnetic media, uh, VHS tapes, which were commonly used during the 1980s and 1990s, 
pneumatic formatted tapes which were produced during the 1970s and uh, perhaps even a bit earlier. There are even open reel videotapes. Uh, I know of a few that were produced by the uh, forerunner to Iowa Public Television when uh, IPTV was simply uh, a single television station in Des Moines when it went on the air in 1959. There are about a half dozen of these uh, two inch wide open reel video tapes which are, we believe, recordings of early classroom instructional programs produced by Channel 11 in Des Moines. In terms of audio recordings, there are uh, any of a number of non-digital formats from earlier times that require uh, special support as well. There are open reel tapes uh, uh, made with acetate or polyester, which require special equipment to play back. Uh, those tape recordings date back to the 1950s. All of those media, and over the years, these media formats have changed. And the challenge that the Archives of Iowa Broadcasting faces, as with all archives with these types of media, is that we need to be able to preserve and access those materials in the future. And time is running out. There are estimates that we have between 12 and 15 years remaining to be able to continue to play back magnetic media such as VHS tapes or open reel audio tapes. Those are very fragile, rather tenuous media. And if we wait too long, it may be too late. It's a, a, a a, a very uh, unique 20th and 21st century problem with recorded knowledge. You can go back to clay tablets from, from millennia past, and they, th those hold up pretty well. There's something pretty durable about a clay tablet, and even paper holds up pretty well over time. But if you begin using media that are dependent upon equipment, uh, you begin running the risk of losing that information. The stations that are best represented tend to be from eastern Iowa, but the archive strives, of course, to receive material from stations throughout the state. Uh, there is material from Des Moines. Uh, the Cedar Rapids Waterloo television market is well represented, and the WQAD collection from the Quad Cities market. Those are really the three best represented areas for television news coverage. There are examples of radio uh, 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 representations as well from throughout the state. KMA in Shenandoah, way out in the southwestern corner of the state, is very well represented with uh, the Radio Homemaker collection. So it, it, uh, it really does run uh, from clear across the state. We have some material from, uh, from Fort Dodge, uh, Spencer, uh, some representation of material from Sioux City, uh, as well as the uh, uh, Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, and Davenport areas. We know in general that there are considerable uh, film and videotape segments of news stories. Also, many, uh, many sports stories and, and features. It is difficult to get a breakdown as far as the uh, percentage goes, but really all types of locally created programming are represented in the holdings, but primarily news and sports. There are some special events, uh, broadcasts uh, that are chronicled as well. There are any of a number of, uh, of uh, radio uh, features, uh, what used to be called jingles. They were the, the trademark of a particular radio station, and we have a few of those represented as well. And uh, yes, there are commercials, although we don't have any identified fully within any collections. We suspect that as we discover more within the holdings that those types of, uh, the, the more ephemeral types of broadcasts are going to be uncovered. The collections that we are aware of include uh, such highlights as Khrushchev's visit to, uh, to Iowa in 1959, 
There are certainly uh, historic weather-related uh, events that have been recorded. Uh, the Old Wine and Charles City tornadoes of 1968 are historic meteorological events that have been committed to film, and, and those are a part of the holdings. The Iowa caucuses, uh, beginning uh, as early as 1972, but really taking the national spotlight in 1976. And we do have uh, news video coverage of local station coverage of the Iowa caucuses uh, beginning uh, in 1976. The Vietnam War, uh, Dean Borg was a correspondent for Channel 2 in Cedar Rapids during the Paris Peace Talks in 1968. Uh, it's a remarkable coverage of, uh, of a very unusual instance of a local television station actually sending its own reporter to uh, what was a significant international story at the time. I think part of the challenge in being able to more fully answer that question is to fully understand what all we have. And this is one of the biggest challenges of managing audiovisual material. We don't know what's on there until we can view it. We can't view it until we secure the funds to adequately recover and restore that media. And that means it takes time and it takes money. But what we do know of what uh, what is there is, is pretty remarkable. The collection right now is unprocessed. They're not in any particular order, and so for a researcher to be able to access them, we need an archivist who can bring some sense of order into those materials and, and catalog them so that we can identify what's where. So on two fronts, we are very, very adamant that we move forward. One is the uh, establishment of a permanent position for an archivist to manage uh, both the broadcasting archives and the Wartburg College archives. And secondly, to ensure that we have adequate funding in place to complete the digital reformatting of that material so that eventually people can access them either on site at local library or in, we hope, many cases online through the Iowa, uh, through, through the Archives of Iowa Broadcasting's website. We're, we're not just talking about a collection that documents the history of an industry, as important as that is, but it's also a collection that contains the opportunity to perform research in any of a number of academic disciplines, simply because of the variety of topics that the collection covers. So that's what I mean when I talk about the versatility, really, of this collection. It's the fact that it has so much uh, academic research potential in any of a number of academic disciplines. And for the rest of us who are radio, TV, history buffs, it's a great collection in that regard, too. What I hope people understand is the fact that this is a unique treasure in Iowa. This is something that not many states have at this scale with such great participation from broadcasters across the state. And we're very, very fortunate to be able to assemble that collection. The next challenge is to ensure that it become uh, a useful, usable collection on both the cataloging and preservation fronts.